everybody. Thanks so much for watching my interview tonight with Jim Ross, trumpet player in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. And before we get started and we talk about Jim a little bit more, I want to thank my sponsors, Euclid IQ, the world's leader in video and audio compression. You can visit them at EuclidIQ.com. And also, uh, this week's sponsor is Guard Bags. So if you uh, like Guard Bags, you can check it out. We pull a lot of things out of there. Like this week in my bag, I have uh, Chris Gecker's articulation study. So Chris, if you're watching, I'm pimping your book. Uh, the Fritz Domro's Shape Up book, which is a new book I really like that he self-publishes. And of course, you can go to Studio 259 Productions and buy all of the Vincent Chickowitz material that Jim is very familiar with and we'll talk about as things go on tonight. So Jim, thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thank you, Mark. There, I said my first A. You can tell I'm back in Canada. <laughs> Do you spell it E-H with an apostrophe or A-Y-E? E-H. E-H. Okay, good. Uh, that may be uh, the most insightful thing we touch base with on tonight. So Probably. Probably so. <laughs> so... Uh, there's so much to talk about with you, but uh, I wonder if you could kind of talk to us about talk to us about how you started and, and what your first experiences were like playing. Sure, I started in uh, elementary school, grade six, at Lord Nelson uh, in Vancouver, in the east end of Vancouver. There's a lot of uh, older schools that still exist, and Lord Nelson is around 100 years old, uh, still exists. Same with my high school, Britannia High School. It's about 110. Um, I started with uh, a band teacher named Winifred Shoemaker, and she had the wherewithal in this very poor neighborhood we lived in to start a band program uh, anew. She got all new instruments, drums, guitars, uh, a stereo. Uh, she had a budget for records. So uh, I started on, actually on trumpet and guitar in elementary school, grade six. Um, and continue that through high school. There was a, a my first year of high school, I quit trumpet and uh, wanted to play bass. And my brother was quite an accomplished drummer and trombone and euphonium player. And the band teacher assured me, even though I didn't know how to use read bass clef, that, oh, your brother will teach you. And he never did. I was just plucking away on the bass by ear, like how I learned off of records. And um, later on, as I sort of got my head around that, I was listening to the trumpets and I thought, you know, I think I think I can add to that and told the band director I played trumpet and started up, up the trumpet again after a, a year of not playing. And then I, late, I later went on to take some lessons at Vancouver Community College and uh, study, uh, study privately with uh, a, a teacher in, in town. Um, and uh, don't have quite the track record I would like when it comes to academic achievements or institutional learning, but I always manage to seek out uh, people to play for and uh, hear me and uh, give me some good advice. Yeah, so talk about your early trumpet lessons with, with Tom uh, Peria and how that, what kind of things were you working on at that? So I, I never took a lesson uh, through high school and then I wanted to study music. So I applied to Vancouver Community College. This was in 1981 and uh, I didn't have any money. So I took the year off and worked actually at a, a fish plant, uh, cleaning up the fish plants after they had been butchering salmon all day and made some money, pay for school. Studied with a man there named Ted Green, which were my first lessons and got exposed to that environment, institutional environment for the first time. I had to undergo an embouchure change. I was playing very low down on the top lip um, and I was playing lead in the, in the stage band and uh, trying to play jazz trumpet, which was, you know, rock and roll and R&B and jazz were my first loves. And uh, my teacher, Ted Green said, you know, I think you need to do an embouchure change if you're going to have this be sustainable. And uh, I don't know quite how to guide you through that. So go see Tom Perriott, who was uh, at the time the associate principal in Vancouver Symphony. And uh, he helped me through that. Uh, Tom had studied, uh, graduated from North Texas. Uh, I think it was Haney was his teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, went on to move to Chicago and play in the Chicago Chamber Brass and study with Mr. Chukowitz and Mr. Jacobs. It was 
later on in 1986, after I'd saved some money from working multiple seasons in the fish plant that I went away myself to Chicago and studied with those same two people. And Tom helped facilitate that. The, the, the MO was a little different um, than it is now. You phoned Mr. Jacobs on a Sunday night at his home and uh, hoped he fit you in his book. And with Mr. Chickowitz, uh, I, uh, myself and Tom both wrote him a letter of introduction. And he decided to, uh, he would have time to take me on as one of his non-Northwestern students. So I was there for uh, a very intense four months. Uh, Vince would uh, invite me into his lessons. He said, listen, you're only here for a short time. I want you to come to my lectures. There was a pedagogy class, which consisted of playing different examples of orchestras from different countries playing either their own nationalistic music or other music. You know, back in the 80s and 70s, there was very distinct styles of playing. They were somewhat regional, as I believe they were in, in the United States as well. You know, Chicago sounded different from Philly, from Cleveland. Um, and we would just sort of get our ears attuned to those different styles. Uh, and I also saw him privately about once every 10 days, like his regular students. I'd see Luther Didrikson, who was the other teacher there, and I would sit in on all my friend's lessons. So I probably spent about eight to 10 hours a week with Mr. Chikowitz, either taking a lesson or watching a lesson. It was, it was very generous of him. Wow. What, can you describe the format of the lessons or was there a regularity to it? or, or kind of The format depended on the student and where they were. Um, the one thing that I thought ran through those lessons was a kind of gentle thoughtfulness about what was going on. Uh, always a reminder to think and act in a musical way and with musical intention and impulse and a sort of reverse engineering about trumpet playing. You know, when you're getting students in Juilliard or Northwestern, you sort of have your pick. You don't have these reclamation projects like, like me coming to your door <laughs> or you have very few of them. So in the lessons with the Northwestern students, I heard a much higher level that I could aspire to. The one thing that ran through them all was a, as beautiful a sound as possible, as much character uh, as possible stylistically uh, within acceptable parameters um, and the ease of production. Uh, I got a lot at the time I was compressing a lot, involving involuntarily, uh, you know, many muscles isometrically, closing off the throat. Um, and he, and Susan later on, actually, Susan Slaughter really got me past that and instilled that in me. How did he get you past, past those uh, issues? What kind of things did he do? Well, he, he never played in the lessons. I, I would sometimes be his first lesson uh, in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I would get there a little early and I could hear him warming up through the door. He was still warming up at that point, but not playing publicly. Um, so he, he, he got me through it by th thinking conceptually or having me think conceptually of uh, in particular sports analogies, right? Uh, from Canada, so I grew up watching hockey. When you hit a slap shot, you have your backswing, which is your breath coming in and you start it. And then when you hit the puck, you don't stop, feel the puck out and then shoot it. It's all one continuous motion. Um, so we did a lot of, um, a few breathing exercises, just getting breath in and out efficiently and, and having it glide down rather than, you know, all that stuff. Um, he had me sing a lot. We played a lot of melodic material, the Bordonis uh, from the trombone book or Rochus, I guess it is. Uh, and, and really uh, purposefully get me on that, that path with basic material. I never felt in watching in my lessons or in watching other people's lessons that he took them so far out of their comfort zone that they still couldn't maintain that ease 
and health of production of sounds. Um, he, he knew when to pull it back. And later on, after I won my Met audition, I, I had won that audition in the December of 94. And my teacher, Tom, had passed away. And I, I didn't play the list for anyone. I didn't do any listening. I just followed the metronome markings and played in a style that I thought was the music was speaking to me in. Um, and I needed some convincing that I could do this. So I went to go see Vince and said, well, I, you know, I just came off tour three months with the ballet orchestra and I've been practicing and I feel this way about my playing. And he sort of reminded me of a, you know, the way your family doctor would be, you know, and he'd say, well, I don't really hear that, but play for me. And it's like, well, I, I sort of see what you're talking about. And then I remember him going to the filing cabinet and then just pulling out all this material that would address specifically the problem I was having. And it's like, yeah, this is like getting a prescription from the doctor. And if I do this, I'm going to be better. So that's, that's a little bit about my experience with Mr. Chikowitz. Yeah. I have to tell I have to tell one anecdote about him if I could. I've been on the faculty of National Youth Orchestra of Canada for the last few years, along with Karen Donnelly and Larry Larson, who's who's been there about ten years. And my first summer, we we're doing pictures. And uh, when I arrived, you get your room key, you get all the information you need, and you get a packet of scores for for the sectionals. And I opened up the score and there was a small edition of pictures and on the top it said V Chickowitz and I'm like this is it this is the Rosetta Stone I, I'm going to understand every single thing about pictures ever known to man and I I opened up the first page leafing I found not a single marking <laughs> just <laughs> not a single thing so I was sharing this story with a student of his and he said, yeah, he pretty much knew that one. <laughs> Didn't need to write anything down. But he was a wonderful man. I always, I always felt uh, when the door shut uh, for the lesson that the world fell away and he was fully invested in what you were doing um, in a kind of gentlemanly uh, avuncular way, not a little bit warm and friendly um, and but quite supportive uh, and, and quite, quite positive. And I'm sure my playing at the time gave him a lot to be negative about, but he was, <laughs> he was very gentle with me. Now, were you using like the, the long tone flow study patterns like everybody's used to, or was he using Yeah, uh, definitely. He had me go out uh, to the Northwestern bookstore um, in, in the student center and, and buy that that book, which along with yours and Michael's material, I, I, I still use. Um, I always go back to it. I know a couple of years ago when I had back surgery, I touched base with you to help me guide through some of that. And that's, you know, you know, our sessions, that's just the very material we used, you know, those, those, those first exercises yeah. just to, just to, to diagnose. So he, I, I think he used those as sort of a, a diagnostic tool as well. And, and we'd all be well served to do that. Sometimes we just go through the motions and do it mindlessly. Yeah. But to really check in with yourself, um, the simplest things are best. And, and, and those still, still hold up as a diagnostic tool, I think. Yeah. Do you remember any like specific instructions or ways he, he talked about how to do those? I mean, other than probably playing musically and simple. Uh, no, just that's it exactly. I don't remember the sequential order, whether we started on the first exercise and then went down semitones or, or, or did, did the one key and then applied it to all the other keys. Um, it, it wasn't that dogmatic. Uh, or I don't, it could have been, I don't remember it as yeah. being that yeah. way. And, uh, and so at the same time, you're studying with Jacobs. Can you talk about the lessons with Jake and then how those, maybe those two things work together or is there anything you had to reconcile? I, uh, I didn't have to reconcile too much, you know, the, Jacobs was to me more, uh, it was a little more singular. It was about understanding the mechanism of the mm -hmm. breath 
um, a lot of the same uh, points with imagery and singing. It was all about singing. There were big commonalities there. I I think I think Vince's take was more applicable and more targeted to the trumpet. Whereas Jake's was maybe a little more global with with brass instruments. Uh, I, I this might be uh, a contentious thing to say, but I, I think many people, including myself, took took the lessons with Jake um, a little too far. Uh, and someone it might have been Pete Bond or Jamie Somerville. Uh, you know, they said, "Boy, that great tuba playing sure has ruined a lot of trumpet players." You know, I, I, for, for, for me, uh, and I hope Vince Pensarella is not hearing this because he, you know, he, Vince credits him as I do. I didn't have the same kind of involvement, but um, uh, I think where we went astray with the trumpet was in volume of air, not the concepts, right. but definitely in volume. And so, you know, my thinking of it has evolved and, Lately, I've been um, the last little while thinking of in terms of um, an enhanced natural breath rather than trying to suck the air out of the room. Uh, but there was a point where I I worked on that just to get the, the mechanism uh, working efficiently and garner an awareness uh, of, of, of how it should be and how it could be. Um, I later f discovered that it wasn't that efficient. Did, uh, and and uh, you said they were very similar. Uh, did one ever ask about the other? Because at that point, they, oh. they were, no. no. Jake was still playing in the orchestra, um, right. although he was subbing out a lot uh, to Rex Martin. Right. Um, and Mr. Chickowitz was not playing publicly. Right, right, right. And then, and, uh, then you also later studied with Susan Slaughter, who also studied with Mr. Jacobs. Can you kind of talk about about Susan's influence and, and what you worked on with her? Well, I I I to this day uh, still do because we're in touch with one another. Credit her with any quote career I've had. She um, she was a hard ass. She she was unrelentingly. Uh, adamant about the standards she had for her very few students and I, I had to she had to be talked into taking me on as a student you know I applied uh, after uh, Northwestern uh, again went back to work for a little couple years because I'd been I I've moved out of the house when I was 18 and been having to keep a roof over my head so had many day jobs but um, you know she had to be talked into uh, into taking me on, not because she'd heard me play or anything, but she, like like her Seth, you know, thought her main focus should be on playing principal trumpet in the orchestra. Uh, um, and at one point, things things were not going well after about three weeks or so. And she looked at me in a lesson and said, "Do you want to sound like this?" And I looked at her in my East fan way and said, yeah, yeah, I do. I do want to sound like this. That's why I traveled halfway across the bloody country to see you. What do you think I want to sound like? You know, and uh, she said, okay, just checking in, seeing where you're at, you know, and, and she was, she was so insistent, you know, she, she was the first one after the limited teaching I had relative to my age, right? So at this point, I'm in my 20s. Yeah. Um, whereas the most people would have gone through the youth orchestras and students uh, uh, lessons early and youth orchestras and uh, have been finished their degree and maybe studying a master's or starting to work. Um, you know, I was still learning. I was, I was still without any degree, uh, still am. Uh, and um, and so she was the first one that really was insistent on keeping me accountable and keeping myself accountable. Um, you know, just 
maybe it's kind of an old school thing, but she'd say, listen, you're going to, you're going to learn all your scales, you know, cause I'm going to ask them. And sure enough, we get to the jury at the end of the year. She's like, stands up in front of the panel and says, you know, Jim's been working really hard all season to uh, learn all his scales. So ask away, you know, and I think it was Tim, Tim Myers, the print, now principal trombone there. He was uh, assistant at the time. He's like, uh, how about F sharp minor? You know, okay, yeah. both octaves, you know, <laughs> and uh, she, she, she's great. Uh, she has the mentality or had that if she was a cancer researcher, there'd be no cancer. I mean, she was ultimately focused and, 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 uh, and she really put in the work to, you know, yeah. She's a really underrated player, I think, in my opinion, too. I mean, I was... There were there was uh, when Slatkin was music director. You know, all those RCA records, uh, the Gershwin, um, all the contemporary stuff, which made her would uh, uh, was really part and par parcel of her championing those Blackburn E flat trumpets uh, with the large bell, uh, because the repertoire they had was punishing. You know. And they had uh, great recordings back in the in the late mid mid eighties up until the nineties. Yeah, the Prokofiev Five, especially I remember, and the the Ravel Piano Concerto recording of her that's outstanding. And yeah, uh, I, I even got to witness her play the Brandenburg, and and she was actually absent in the orchestra for a few weeks. And Gary, uh, no, not Gary, I'm sorry, Tom, the assistant. Tom yep. Drake uh, covered it. And it was his first season there, actually. He sounded fantastic. Um, but she took some time off to, to get ready for the Brandenburg. And here's a story about her. She, and the kind of person she is, she was saying, you know, I was giving a recital and not feeling comfortable. So her solution is, was not to stop playing recitals. She said, so I programmed four more recitals. <laughs> you know, that's... That's a, a, a little insight into her, uh, her her personality. Yeah, she and she also talked about uh, dental issues. I've seen, I saw her do a clinic about this with she was putting in her mouth and yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I had forgotten that she had various appliances, as does John Hagstrom. Yeah. Um, a few people I know uh, Gould had one for a little while because he had a crooked tooth and it would cut into his lip. Ray Riccamini has one, um, and. I, I thought that Mark in particular uh, used it to great effect until he dropped it and it fell down the pit it's a couple stories below <laughs> in, the, in the middle of a show, putting it in, fumbled around. So, oh, man. Oh, you hope it wasn't like a, a, some kind of something from the ring cycle or something. Like I couldn't tell any difference in his playing. It was just as good. Yeah, for sure. And so, and, and let's talk about your, your work experience before the Met. So can you kind of walk people through that? Because it, it was, like you said, it was a, a winding road a little bit. Well, I, I, as I stated earlier, I moved out of the house after I graduated high school. Um, seems that there was a long tradition of that in my family. My brother left as soon as he could to join the Navy and my sister moved in with her boyfriend then to become husband when she was able there was nothing bad going on at home no. but it, it it was um you know i lived across the street from a housing project it was that kind of neighborhood and uh, i was thought myself lucky to have what we had um, i just wanted to be on my own and a little more independent so i had a lot of day jobs the, the chief one was working at a place called ocean fisheries and i started uh doing cleanup crew which as you can well imagine, is not a fun job cleaning up after they've been butchering tens of thousands of pounds of fish a day. Uh, and, you know, studying while I was in Vancouver Community College, I put together an R&B band because I loved R&B. So we would play different dances, um, sometimes for a fee, sometimes for the door. Um, and that got me involved in the jazz scene a little bit. Uh, and so I was freelancing in Vancouver and eventually ended up with uh, getting hooked up with the contractor for the Vancouver Opera, CBC Radio Orchestra, and all the freelance work that the symphony didn't do. 
you know, it's a small enough town that the symphony, like, like most places is the, the top of the food chain. Right. Um, so I was nibbling around the edges, if you will, uh, doing all sorts of stuff. I joined a military band of military, uh, reserves, Canadian Armed Forces Reserves, and played in the band. Got a lot of union work through that, Di different stuff, big bands, concert bands, herald trumpets, brass quintets. I played with uh, reggae bands, Latin bands, uh, African bands, I mean, you name it. Uh, and But at some point, when I started studying with Tom uh, in the early 80s, someone said to me, hey, you should... Uh, you should play this thing, pictures at an exhibition. You got to know this if you're going to be a trumpet player. So the, play the promenade and oh, I learned the notes, you know, and I went out to his house and I played it in a lesson. He goes, you've never heard this before in your life, have you? I said, no, <laughs> uh, you know, at that point I'm listening to Earth, Wind and Fire and Van Halen and Zappa and, you know, Sly and the Family Stone. And, uh, uh, he put on the Chicago Rhino recording from 56, 58, something in there, the cataracts on it and, and Bud. And I, I don't even think Chickowitz is in the section yet. Probably Rudy Nashon at that point, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. And this whole brass sound happened. And I was like, my God, what is that? You know, my, my world just grew, exploded with hearing this. Um, so that got me into orchestral music. Um, so I didn't have any full-time jobs. I was freelancing. And then I decided uh, one of the freelance orchestras I was playing in, their concert master was from Mexico. He was in fact from a town called Guanajuato, and, uh, which is in central Mexico, beautiful, beautiful town. And they had a trumpet opening and I called up the personnel manager. He goes, okay, come down. Someone will meet you at the bus station. Well, no one ever met me at the bus station. So imagine this dumb gringo Canadian you know, in the bus station in Mexico City, looking for a bus to get to Guanajuato with his phrase book, you know, going up to the ticket counter. Una billeto para Guanajuato, por favor, primera clase. And then she talked to me and I was like, that's all I got. <laughs> she shoes me away, you know. Later, later on, I learned that they didn't have a first class bus there. That's what she was telling me. So I hopped on the second class bus. No one's there to meet me at the bus station in this town. It's two in the morning. I get a taxi to take me to a hotel. Wake up the next morning. I have the day off. And, but I see someone with a violin case. And I was like, well, he's either going to orchestra rehearsal or to mariachi rehearsal. So I followed him into town, ended up in the theater, walked in. They're like, oh, you're the new guy? I mean, it was, it was you know, no language, no, no idea of the culture. Um, there was a mix of Eastern European and uh, gringos and some Latinos in there, but that was in Guanajuato, Mexico. Um, and then I later left that job and moved to Toluca, which was uh, uh, the capital of, of the state of Mexico. It's close to Mexico City and worked there. Um, Andy uh, Balio was the principal trumpet there. And uh, the orchestra was turning over. They were just firing everyone. So I was there as an interim principal. Was Bonte and, uh, the conductor there? That's, that's when he came back. I'm sorry. So, oh man, well, I was warned. <laughs> it wasn't <laughs> like I was warned, you know? Uh, and I, there's players all over the world who've had interactions with that person. Jim Thompson and I had a, shared a lot of stories, you know? The, not, I'm not counting myself amongst them, but there was great trumpet players going down to Mexico and back then and in, in, in the 70s, you know. I think Tim Morrison was there, Jim Thompson, just a whole bunch of people. Yeah, yeah. But so you had this warm, loving, caring conductor. Oh, yes, yes. Efficient, never, never on drugs, supportive. At one point, I couldn't take it. We were doing a Tchaikovsky symphony, one of, one of the early ones, you know, two or three, and I missed a note, and and uh, he stops. He goes, you can't do that. You can't miss a note. And I, I palmed my head and went, thank you, maestro. I never knew that. 
and no one talked back to this guy, right? Wow. And and from then on, it was like he was paranoid about me. He was like, "Don't look at me. I, I'm not beating on you right now." You know, when I'd watch him playing something, so which made me just zero in on him even more. Uh, it ended up my time in Mexico with me being camped out in the orchestra office for a number of days, trying to get the money they owed me when I left. So I came back to Canada, started work at the fish plant again, uh, started freelancing, continued studying, and then fell in with the contractors from the Vancouver Opera and uh, various groups that came to town. And, and uh, that's what I did before I went to the Met. Okay, great. You talk about the, the Met audition a little bit. How you, I mean, how you prepared, we, we touched on it just a little bit ago when you talked about Chickowitz, but what do you remember about that, about the audition? Well, I remember I didn't start auditioning until my late 20s uh, when the Vancouver Symphony job came up when my teacher had died. They had stopped using me after he passed away uh, and used a couple other people in town and they didn't advance in the audition and I was amongst the handful of uh, people at the end, Larry Knopp won it, uh, still is there. He sounds fantastic. Um, and I thought, well, I set the record straight. Uh, I proved myself of all the local people. I'll start getting the calls. Never happened. In fact, they never called me until I won the Met job. So, uh, so that was my first audition. And I think I benefited from being a little older and having a good sense of myself and my limits and my capabilities and being assured of myself, uh, assured of myself rather. Um, and I did um, uh, Royal Ballet or sorry, Canadian Ballet in Toronto and was a finalist there with Karen Donnelly and um, Mark Damaratnan. And then I went to Symphony Nova Scotia um, and won the principal job there and I, told them, I said, well, I'll accept the job, but I have a, an audition at the Met in three weeks. And if I would, you know, if I'm winning, I'm going to take that job. And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we'll wait for that phone call. You know. <laughs> so, but ultimately with that job, the Symphony of Nova Scotia job, I just thought, man, we were going back after the audition, all the people who are left uh, in the semifinals and finals. And as tradition has it, the winner buys the beer. At least it's that way in Canada. And I thought, man, if I want to make no money and live by the ocean, I should just stay in Vancouver and not have winter to deal with. Uh, I went and took a red eye flight after a performance of the Pearl Fishers here in Vancouver. Stayed with a friend of a friend uh, on the east side. And my whole mindset was, I'm going to go and see what this is about. Um, I may never get to New York again. Uh, I like to think I can, uh, uh, you know, do a decent job at this audition. And I went in with the mindset of only pleasing myself. Right. As, as I said, I, pre I prepared the material with no, uh, no one else's input, but I put in a lot of time on it and a lot of thought. Um, and I have a couple of distinct memories of that audition and the headspace I was in. Uh, I had been introduced quite some time ago to, uh, you know, inner game of tennis and those types of books. Um, and this sense of uh, being uh, observ observing yourself but not being critical in that moment, because it's the conversations you have in your head at the moment that really screw you up. Um, so I almost viewed myself as two separate beings, you know, the, the one operating the trumpet in the moment and someone else standing next to me, like you would have in a lesson situation and observing and, and thinking, oh, uh, ha having the right conversation with yourself, not like, oh man, I, I should have taken it faster, you know, uh, what I thought instead of that was, if, if I play this again, I'm going to play it faster. And it was all about it in, in, in intention, you know. Susan Slaughter used to say to me in a lesson, she was saying, um, she'd ask me to play something or assign something and she'd say, can you do that? Like, 
you know, can you prepare that? And I say, yeah, she goes, will you do it? Two, two distinctly different mindsets. Um, yeah. So it was more of a, a, a non-judgmental, non -criti it was critical, but not harsh. Like, you know, if that comes around again, try it this way or like, oh, hey, that went really well. So it was a, it was a positive conversation I was having with myself. And the other thing I remember is being completely unprepared for winning the job. Uh, and I, my friends and colleagues would tell you I am not aware of fashion at all. So I had no, <laughs> no thought of even winning the job. So I showed up in my usual jeans and t-shirt and I went in to meet the committee and Pantolfi looks at me and goes, well, finally, someone in the orchestra who dresses worse than I do. <laughs> So, and, and, and I went out that night and celebrated. I went to the Blue Note. I went to a blues club. I ended up catching a train to Montreal where I had my flight from, you know, completely hungover, still drunk, you know, going on the subway for the first time and experience all those New York things for the very first time. It was, uh, it was uh, a, a great memory that I still, still hold dear. Do you remember calling people after this? Like, did you call Susan or... I, I tried to, uh, I went to a payphone in Columbus Circle. Remember payphones? Yeah, yeah. And I, uh, I, I tried calling my mom and uh, sh she was away for the weekend. There was no answer. This was pre-cell phone, you know, 1994. And, uh, or before they were common anyway. And then I phoned my girlfriend, now my wife, and got her answering machine. And I'm like, well, I'm all out of quarters now. There's no one else to call. <laughs> yeah, I know that. I remember you and I have talked uh, before uh, specifically about that audition. I know you still have the, the letter and and. Uh, oh yeah, I framed I, I I framed the letter from the orchestra secretary telling me, uh, e Elaine uh, was her name. Uh, you know, where the Lincoln Center is located and the practice rooms are few and far between, and make sure you do your warming up before you come and. This is my assigned time was 2.20 p.m. I remember that distinctly. How many rounds were there, two or three? There was three. There was about three days of prelims and then a day of semis and finals. Yeah. Um, and I think, I know the finals, there were three of us. Yeah. Uh, something interesting happened between the semis and the finals. I and everyone has their own feelings about when they play and they needing rest and all this. But I was the last one to play in the semifinals. Mm -hmm. And the, and then we drew numbers out of the hat and I was the first one to play in the finals. And uh, I thought, well, huh. all right. And they said, we're gonna set you up in this room. We're taking a small break. Um, and I know now that's so you can run upstairs and go to the cafeteria and grab a sandwich. and use the bathroom, um, but we'll come get you in 20 minutes. And I said, okay. And so I brought my stuff into the room and all the horns and oiling the valves and I'm starting to go through the list mentally and uh, there's a knock on the door. And I said, oh, it's not 20 minutes, it's like four minutes, yeah. you know? And uh, it was uh, the assistant personnel manager at the time, Scott Stevens. And he said, uh, we, we have to move you to another room. Um, sorry, you know, and I said, that's fine. But I'm telling you that once we get to the other room, the 20 minutes is starting again, because I need 20 minutes. And so again, going back to waiting till I was maybe a little more mentally ready for these uh, events that auditions are, um, I had the assuredness to say, no, this is my time um, I don't want to say I was mature at the time because I'm completely immature still, but I had enough wherewithal to, to, to just say, this is the one shot I got and, uh, I'm going to get what I need. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what you played in the finals? I think I played Aida, played some ring stuff, uh, Berlioz La Troyenne, uh, probably the first trumpet part to Rigoletto, the introduction. 
there was no orchestral repertoire like there has been lately at the uh, at the Met with uh, with uh, the auditions. Um, uh, as I s told you before, I, I do actually have the the material still um, packed away uh, with with the order that I played. Um, the ring stuff was for me the hardest of, and the and Vatsek, yeah. you know, um, those those were the two hardest things. Just completely stylistically opposite as well. Right, right. So, uh, and you already had a lot of opera experience, though, relatively speaking, before you got into Meta, right? Well, I had more than most. I had played looks like six operas, <laughs> six or eight operas. You know. That's more than most when they come to the Met. That's right. That's, well, so what, were, what were the things that you learned on the job? I mean, one of the questions I had was uh, if you could maybe contrast playing in the pit versus playing on stage. Well, playing on st a stage, uh, the one big takeaway from being on the in the pit uh, and the one thing that the Met Orchestra does, I believe, and, and many believe that is better than any other orchestra is to follow people. Um, what you're seeing on the podium from a seat in the brass section at the Met in the pit bears no correlation to the sounds that are happening. They're usually, the conductor is quite far ahead because he's got to bring the stage along. Right. Um, you'll also many times see them giving early cues to the stage and maintaining a different tempo in their other hands. Um, uh, my time on the stage, both with Seattle and the New York Philharmonic was all about being on top of the beat. In fact, so much so at the Philharmonic that I thought this can't possibly be right. We're doing, doing Nutcracker. Um, and and I thought we're way ahead of, there was no handoff there. We like, we sacked the quarterback there. We interrupted the line. And I went back and listened to the uh, to the recording, and it was it was seamless, you know. Yeah. So, uh, really learned uh, my my time my season with Philharmonic was all about being right on top of it, and and consistency. Like it, it's not that it was the same any every way in a generic way, but there was uh, there was a way of playing that it was still in the moment, but it wasn't as variable as adjusting to the sound coming from the stage, which, you know, the orchestra of the Met, one of the wonders of it is you go in one night to do a standard piece, a butterfly, and you go in the next time to do it three days later, and there's a different cast and a different conductor and different orchestra, essentially. People for those rep shows switch in and out. So, you know, when I started, it was, I didn't know who was going to be there, Mark or Mel. We had, we had some uh, autonomy, which we've We've managed to keep uh, in the trumpet section with me, Ray, and Pete for all these years in that we did our schedule according to our needs. Said, so, you know, with, with, with Pandolfi, it was all about what he was comfortable playing because of his eyesight. Right. Um, and we'd start with that. What, what don't you want to play? What do you want to play? What week do you want for vacation? All right, let's craft the schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and maybe talk about you know, I mean, you talk about playing with Mark and playing with Mel, quite different players, different people. Well, there was no playing with Mel. You couldn't, you couldn't match him. Uh, it was a very singular stylistically. Um, you know, you've heard some of the quotes, you know, play as loud as you can. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember I was playing second trumpet in a rehearsal or something and Pete was playing third. And we, we finished playing a passage and Mel turns to us and says, you know, gentlemen, we're all individuals and we're all artists and, you know, we should satisfy ourselves when we play and, and it doesn't all have to be the same, you know, we don't have to all play the same. And I looked at Mel and I went, Mel, it's a unison. <laughs> so... That was his mindset, but to his very last day, man, he was the consummate professional with his preparation, with his practicing, with his marking his parts. You know, he wrote out a, 
all his own parts, which worked all except for one show of Boris Good Enough when we were doing a new edition and he had had his own part. Um, Gergiev didn't much like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, he would mark uh, often the conductor, the singers, which trumpet he used. Um, he would, in an opera that didn't have a lot of action, he, you know, the Puccini operas in particular, he wrote out the whole trumpet section parts, which were exquisitely crafted. Um, and he, but he would, he would point across the orchestra to cue whoever was coming in next. Like he was fully involved the whole time and, and, and engrossed in the performance uh, every night. So in that way, a consummate professional. Mark, uh, Mark was a more, uh, I'm, I'm going to get shit because he's going to hear this and he's going to call me. <laughs> uh, he, he was a more, quote, standard player. I, I think he was uh, a, a greater musician and is a greater musician than is able to be expressed in an orchestra job. It wasn't until... We did uh, Stravinsky Octeta and I heard him play La Soie. I went, I, I get it now. I get where he's coming from. He's a, he's a chamber musician. And then, you know, later on his own, um, his own Pink Baby Monster projects and all that. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have much time for those. He'd, he'd come in, hey man, want to hear my rap? And I just like, no. <laughs> Congratulations on discovering the spoken word, Mark. But it's, 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 I've heard it. It's not new, man. You just ain't been doing it. <laughs> but I, I got, I got, I gotta say, it's a complicated. I, 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 I love and respect him. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, I think even he will admit that sitting with him for six or eight hours a day could be trying. <laughs> How was that? I, maybe he's listening. Um, oh, we'll I mean, find I, out. I, we'll find out. Uh, either now or later or tomorrow or something. We'll find out. Um, what about, uh, so talk a little bit about Pandolfi. How did Jim's influence on the section, how did, and, and sound and, and everything. This is really so, so Mark, Mark was the sort of ringmaster, if you will. You know, he, he would say, I, he, he would often assign us things to do or things to cover or, or suggest that if he was going to be off and Mel was not going to play that one of us would play something and he would he would tailor it to our skills and he would say, if I need anything technical, I'll get Bon to play it. I need some high notes, I'll get Dolph. He goes, Poochie, I haven't figured you out yet. So <laughs> I said, give me the whole notes. Um, so uh, Jim was the conscience of the section. And by that, I mean the brass section. It was, uh, there were many times where his behavior and my behavior, all of our behaviors, quite frankly, would have these days landed us, ended up, uh, landed us in HR. You know, Jim would just say, say you know, what, what are you doing? What are you, you, you can't play it like that. You know, he would just be, he'd be very, very, upfront about it. It sounds and pretty not, rated for Jim, what you just described. Pretty what? Rated G. Well, you know, it's it's a family channel here, Mark. You're going <laughs> to yes. keep your sponsors happy. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> what about, talk about, because uh, we were talking before we came on, and I, you know, I studied with Jim, and of course you worked with him forever, in his ideas about sound. Can you talk about that and, and where that went into your head? Well, th th he had a couple of pet sayings, and one of them was um, "better sharp than out of tune." Yes, and you know, put some spin on the sound, or as he told Jimmy Levine, "I got to put the fucking spin on the sound." When he was playing the Brandenburg, um, funny story about that: uh, they were doing the Brandenburg at one of these Carnegie Chamber concerts, and Dolph was playing it. He he could roll up out of bed at six in the morning and play it flawlessly. And Levine was like, well, it's a little too loud. Dolph is a little too loud. You know, could you play less? Things? I got to put the fucking spin on the sound, Jimmy. You know, so the, the solution was to get him a pillow 
and to sort of put it on a stand and play in the pillow. So that he, he kept that pillow. And when, uh, when he retired, Pete got a hold of the pillow and burned a hole in it with a blowtorch and got Levine to sign it to say, you know, to Dolph from, from Jimmy. And uh, it was the greatest retirement gift ever. But, uh, Didn't have, like, you know, on the back of it or something like that. Yeah, Pete's, Pete's, a, Pete's amazing that way. Um, you know, very, very handy. But, uh, you know, another thing of Jim's, which was, and I've come around to this way of thinking a bit, it's, you know, being in tune doesn't mean you're resonant. And, and I, I, I asked some singers about that too. My daughter's a singer. And I would ask singers at, uh, at work, it's like, why do tenors always sing sharp? You know, and he said, it's not about the pitch, it's about where things are resonating. And when things are resonating, you're attracted to them, right? So I think quite naturally, people will be drawn into it, depending on what the voice is, if it's a predominant voice. Um, and all, there's two other things. There's the, the efficiency of production mm -hmm. uh, with actually using less air and making it spin, having it sit on top of the sound a little more. Um, I had done a couple of videos on Facebook uh, last week about that, where I was just feeling like the sound wasn't energized and the pitch was sagging and I adjusted mentally and a little physically where I was placing the air and what I was, where I think I was placing the air on, on the pitch. And it immediately livened up the sound and raised the pitch, not imperceptibly, but kept it from sagging. Um, yeah. And the other is in terms of being heard, the more highs in the sound, the better it is to cut through the orchestra. Uh, my tendency for a long time was to think bigger and wider and all that does is get bigger and wider. It doesn't translate to being out in the house. It gives some comfort to the person next to you when you're playing second and uh, they have something to sit on, you know, a cushion there, but you, you have to balance that with what's getting out in, in front of your bell as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Jim also, he's a large man, although he's, he's only about 220 pounds now, but he's like six, four, you know, so he could afford to top up here, just, uh, just up here, just in the chest, you know, Yeah. but yeah. he's right in a way, your lungs are high up. And if you want energized air, if you place it higher up, or these days, uh, top it off with a little nose breath you know it's you could see my shoulders aren't rising um this is engaged and moving your stomach's not sticking out it's not that you're engaging your abdominals but your lungs are up here they're not down there so to have it ready and available you know the superman pose yeah and we would hear singers uh I very rarely do this ties into pete's concept of using speech and singing as a physical model for, for playing. Uh, you know, we rarely see them take big, huge breaths. We can see them engaged. I remember being on the stage and being above Anna Netrebko and seeing her take a breath for a phrase and seeing her back expand at the ribs, you know, not down low, because of course they're in costumes too, right? Most of the time, right. except for rehearsals. Um, or tenors going for a high note, just giving a little, little quick sniff, you know, you never see them taking in copious amounts of air with, with, with the exception of Dmitry Horostovsky, who had in, incredibly long phrases that he could sing because he was taking in that kind of air, but he still had a brilliant, uh, uh, I don't want to say bright, but resonant sound fills with, filled with a lot of highs. And he's a baritone, you know, I think that's confusing sometimes. Some of those concepts. I mean, I I understand it because I've been around Jim and you play with him. But I feel like sometimes when you explain that, like playing on the top part of the sound, and don't mistake resonance and pit. I mean, just the way that stuff intertwines, you really have to hear it, right? You know what I mean, that? yeah. The you 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 need a model. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, you can talk about it all you want, and. and but until you actually hear it and have that aha moment, you know, sometimes your body can inform you. And that goes back, that's how Jim's teaching in a way, 
ties in my mind to Chickowitz and Jacobs in that it's a little counterintuitive. You conceive of the result and the effect and the character of sound you want, and your body will inform you how to do it. That's not to say that I can go, I want a double high C and play a double high C, but I'm talking about musical concepts. Um, once you get past the purely mechanical part, um, a lot of times the, the result you want and the character of sound and the style will inform your body on what to do. Once you've, once you've achieved a certain amount of proficiency. Um, there are some students, I've had one that's just an absolute great mimic, you know, which meant he came to lessons completely unprepared, but had the ability that once, oh, once sorry, I, you have a guess. I guess, oh. Oh my, Pete. That better be water. Agua fria, baby. How are you? So far, so mediocre. We just mentioned you. Oh, that's why I signed on. I, you know, yeah. Wow, that's why he's still in the basement. Carla will not let me out. She should get, it's all boarded over, you know, and I, well, it's where I live. You made the mistake of letting her back. Well, yeah, there's that. Yeah. Did, did she, did she finish? No, she, she, uh, she gave up. She, she found it too hard to be away from yeah. the dogs. She was kicking <laughs> ass academically. She was doing great, yeah. but, yeah. um, and I, 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 I wish there was some way I could find to make it work. Cause she was really thriving, but she found it, she found it difficult to be away. Oh, well, so, uh, under, understandable as, yeah. as am I, even though I'm in my hometown, you know, leaving. Well, and you got your family. I have my family here which is great and my old dear friends, but there's, uh, you know, things, things have, have really changed and we, we don't know whether we're going to get them back for a while. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little, uh, I won't say disheartening, but it's, it's, it's still an adjustment for me. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, retirement sure is an adjustment, quite a mental, uh, mental flip. Yeah, Dave Lang, let's remember him telling me, he's, uh, for those of anyone listening, Dave Lang let's, is our former principal trombone. And he said, yeah, you got to make sure you have something to do. Otherwise, you just end up watching Oprah and drooling on your shoes. <laughs> I better put my shoes on. <laughs> dry, dry your shoes off. Are those shoes waterproof? Exec them all. So while I have you guys both on here, were you guys both on the on the uh, uh, was it the Rosen Cavalier where Mel had the stroke? Oh no, that's 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 Pete's baby. It, was that Dolph? Was that before you? Was Dolph there? It, it, it was. I had auditioned and in the winter of '94, and this was the spring of '95. Okay, yeah, because the timelines all messed up. But yeah, he fell on me. Yeah, so. Wow. And then my my first year, uh, he had been Mel had been through the stroke uh, in the spring. Mark had started uh, started the season, but then went out for his I think his second back surgery, so he right. was out for for a long right. time. And Mel was back doing seven shows a week, five rehearsals. We call it the full Melvin. Yeah. Every every show and every performance is he he was and, back six weeks after the stroke in the parks playing in the parks man you know it, it took it took jim pandolfi going to him and saying mel this you know this this isn't right we we, we can take some of the load here um very gently steering steering him away from doing that to himself and, and quite frankly to us yeah yeah it's it's, I mean, it's an it's an unsustainable burden to do that if, if he had retired after the stroke mythic ending to a career mythic yeah. ending yeah, played the final solo beautifully. Would you, you tell the story? Because a lot of people probably don't know what what happened. You mean there's other people other than the three of us on this screen? There are uh, eleven. Oh, no, no, they don't, no, they're watching. People are probably watching. But lurkers, uh, stalkers. Okay. Uh, well, so we're we're um we're playing Rose and Cavalier. I believe it was a broadcast. Levine is conducting. And we get we get to the 
we're in act three, we get to the end of the show, and Mel was in the habit of, um, he would keep a cup of ice water on his stand. Uh, we had little shelves on the stands. And um, he reached for his glass and missed it. And I kind of went. And then he said, I don't think I'm going to make it. Catch me if I, if I fall. And which didn't, um, this didn't worry me as much as you might think, because Mel had a history of blacking out on high licks. And I knew that uh, my predecessor, Lynn Berman, would catch him after he played, he would play a passage in uh, Salome or something. And he, you know, he's a super high compression player and he would black out and, and uh, Berman would catch him and count him back in. And so I knew that was a thing. I knew that happened. It hadn't happened to me. So he said this and I was like, okay. And he, and then of course the next, his next entrance was a high D flat. It was beautiful. And then he fell on me and did not recover. Wow. You know, it was like, I, and was... I never even looked over and I'm, I'm not calling the medics or calling the telling the percussion section, get EMPs in here. You know, Levine never even looked over. My, my experience with that was um, with him in that way was, I think it was a, a year or two before he, he passed away, we were doing a, a Flatermouse broadcast on a Saturday. And uh, I, I was I was very sick. I, I had the flu, but I was over the worst of it and came in anyway, because it was the broadcast and didn't want to stick anyone with that. Um, and I, yeah, I no one wanted to play Flatermouse. <laughs> <laughs> right and, and and then do saturday night you know and right. be sober yeah right the daily uh, and uh i came in before the start of the second act and mel's clutching his chest and i'm like this this isn't right and i go mel are you okay and he's like no no i'm not you know just an obvious pain and and i said mel i'm, I'm gonna get you some some help and i got the personnel manager and they called security and they pulled him out of the pit. And as they're carrying him out, you know, as I told you before, he used to write his own parts out and he, he stops everyone. He, he turns to me, he goes, James, use my part. <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be the last words I hear from Mel Broyles because it looked like a heart attack. Turned out later to be diverticulitis or something, which uh, I think led to his, his cancer. But uh, singular player, I think both Pete and I have mentioned before publicly that while it was uh, tough to endure sometimes, he was in many ways a consummate professional as far as his preparation and uh, his dedication, yeah, every, his concentration. Uh, you know, so many players of that era, I think that the, the job became their identity. You have to re remember when he was starting, you know, it was a really not a great job. They'd have to do seven performances a week, run outs to Brooklyn, summer season, ballet. You know, they were, they had no time for family life. They had no, none of the work uh, conditions that uh, exist now that, by the way, our current management is trying to get rid of. Um, but none of the work rules that we, uh, we uh, benefit from now. Talk about that a little bit, both of you guys, about the, the, the schedule and, and uh, what was a normal week like when things are working? Well, it was seven performances a week for 33 weeks, uh, Sundays off, uh, anywhere from three to five rehearsals a week. Uh, rehearsal times have morphed over the years when, when both Pete and I started, I think they started at 11 a.m., and the curtain was at 8 p.m. They've since morphed into 10.30 or even 10 o'clock rehearsals and earlier curtains, variable we'll curtain, curtain times. Time depend, in, in order to get the show in by midnight so they don't have to pay overtime to the local one stage hands. So you do that for 33 weeks, and that 33 weeks was, was preceded by three weeks of preseason, double rehearsals every day, uh, Monday to Saturday. And then at the end of the season, we'd have, I think, a week or two off, Pete, maybe three. And then we'd have a week or so of rehearsals and we head off on tour, either with the whole company, uh, you know, every last wig and bobby pin and 
and person uh, imaginable, uh, or on a symphonic tour, which, um, which my first season was, was a European symphonic tour in the summer. And prior to that, there would there were there were uh, concerts in the parks. Every borough of Manhattan oh, yeah. had a trailer and and uh, sound system, and we would do a, a staged version of an opera with just the principal singers and uh, and uh, and the orchestra. And, and previous to those tours, they had um, uh, train tours to designated cities. Uh, Atlanta being one, and I believe Pete, you you played uh, extra in an Aida. When I lived in no, it's Bohem. Oh, Bohem. I was I was a freelance in Atlanta in the eighties, and my teacher called me up and said, um, "You want to play with the opera tonight?" And I said, oh, "I never played an opera before." He says, "We'll show up at the Civic Center Theater." at this time i show up not knowing anything about anything somebody says here's your uniform here's the music you go on in 30 minutes show business yeah and, and lynn berman was leading all of us yeah i didn't know there was a state i didn't know anything here put this on you're going to march across stage you're going to play this and you're marching down the stairs you know it's a zephyrelic production and, and have it memorized yes and it was nuts i just couldn't even believe it <laughs> talk about that aspect too because i mean i mean there's two things i wanted to touch on it's not the same opera every night if you people haven't been to see the met before or are not familiar with that it's not the same opera every night. And then sometimes you guys are dressing up in costumes and going on stage and crazy stuff can happen can I ask a question sorry you mean to mute you, Jim? Yeah. <laughs> I need to teach at 6.30. So I'll let him go before too long. Um, don't worry, Jim. We'll wrap it up when we need, whenever you need to. Uh, I to say, what, what kind of stories happen that you guys can tell about things that happen as you are in a costume, you're off stage? Nothing has ever happened. Nothing? Never. It's a well-oiled machine. Absolutely. Just goes okay. like clockwork. Were you on that torn dot stage band where we got locked out of the balcony and were stuck in the hallway? No, that was that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the person that was supposed to unlock the doors for us got fired. Um, my first season, we were doing Fille de Regiment, which has uh, an offstage, two offstage trumpets and, uh, and one field drummer, a little bugle call. And I was playing with Mel and Mel said, you know, James, you should always look at those things in case you might have to play it. You never know what might happen. And uh, I thought, okay, oh, oh, it's a little bugle call. Okay, great. And uh, the next night we do it and there's a tap on my shoulder. Gould's in a pit. And uh, we had just started experimenting with these earlier curtain times and uh, there's a tap on my shoulder. It's like, can you go up to the to the stage to to, to play the offstage call? And I'm like, uh, okay. And and he he just yanks me out of my chair. We go running up the stairs, you know, come into stage left, and there's a bunch of supers there in soldiers' outfits. Like, do you know where the trumpets are? They're like looking at us like, what's a trumpet? You know, you hear me? Where, where the the music? Where, where's the offstage music come from? They're like, oh, yeah, over on the other side. Which and, means you have to go down, across, and back up. Well, luckily there was a crossover backstage. Okay, all right. But uh, you know, you you do these things with a, with a, an assistant conductor watching a monitor of the maestro, and he counts you in, and you got up. You're hearing yourself a little ahead, um, and as is the tradition in opera that Pete and I probably still do, you count the rests backwards: eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, last play and I, I i arrive this is in two four time just to hear eight seven and the, the other player goes what part do you want to play and i say second <laughs> and in, in we play so it's i go back to the pit and i'm like well that was that was strange you know this this is the met things aren't supposed to happen like that and uh gould looks at me he goes i won't use the language you use but he's like where were you and I said, I had to go up to cover the, I guess Pandolfi didn't show. He got confused with the call time. And it's like, I've been working here for 20 years. And they ask you, you've been here two months. And he starts in on me. Right, because you got a pit and stage. 
which which I knew nothing about. You got a I got big an, bonus. That was a big pay. That was a big I, payday. I got an extra payment to do a pit and stage. Yeah, that's a know, big bonus. Like, You're taking kid food out of my kid's mouth. <laughs> he's, he's like, <laughs> that's hilarious. This was right before his surgery, so I'm sure he uh, his his tirade was medically induced, chemically induced rather. Could be. Well, well Pete, were you there uh, when Pandolfi had the uh, when he went off stage in character and was supposed to act like he was drinking something? You know what I'm talking about? Yes, I do. Can you tell that story? Well, he just went on. He, he was. Uh, this is Pagliacci. Um, and he goes on and he's dressed in this bizarre green velour. He's he looks ridiculous. Oh, his regular oh. clothes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, we've been street clothes. <laughs> and he and he's it's it's he, he's introducing the circus. It's a big party scene and it's it's a rowdy. And he brought a flask on stage and he's like, you know, drinking scotch and Meth, method actor. Yeah, method acting. And um and you know, somebody like smelled it and and they told us the um, uh, uh, orchestra personnel manager and the personnel manager the next that night, maybe next day, calls Gould, the principal, says, uh, Mark. Uh, so some people say Jim was drinking on stage and Mark goes, no way, no, no way. Total professional. He would never do that. And Gould calls Pandolfi and says, Dolph, were you drinking on stage? Well, I, uh, deny, deny, deny. <laughs> or the words of Mel Broyles, no one must know. That's right. Ironically, the, the last thing that I did um, uh, was Elisir, which is a big stage role. And the director, Bartlett Scher, I'm sitting on top of a wagon for this long time. And Bartlett Scher says, he's not doing anything. Give him a flask. He should look like he's drinking. So I'm, I, I was actually supposed to be drinking, but I didn't. So when I, I remember uh, opening night, a uh, uh, person, a manager says, remember, no drinking till you get on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I could ask this question of both, uh, both of you as well. What was the first opera you played in, and was there like a moment of like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm in this orchestra? What do you go, Pete? My first day on the job, was an August recording session for Manon Lescaux. Um, I didn't know opera from a hole in the ground. I didn't know New York from anything. I found the address. I went in. It's the seventh floor of you know this building owned by the Moonies or something. Oh, Manhattan Center, yeah. Manhattan Center, exactly. And um, I went in, and the orchestra spread out in this gigantic old ballroom. And we're playing Manon Lescaux. We play the the you know the, the overture or the you know opening music. Beautiful. The orchestra's fabulous. And Pavarotti's standing like 15 feet behind me. And he starts singing. And I was like, I never heard anything like that in my life. It was it was him and Morella Franey. And to hear these singers sing live is just mind blowing. Yeah. yeah. It's just unbelievable. You know, and, and while Jim's off camera, we might as well plug your new book, which I need to order. Oh. Tell you can't order it. It's sold out. My new book. Singing Trumpet. By Carl Fisher. By Carl Fisher. <laughs> or it's not, published by. Yeah. Not not that Carl Fisher. No, that guy he plays in the wrong octave. He would never he'd never make it at the Met. <laughs> right. When when Bergeron was on the other week, I said we're three thousand miles apart and two and a half octaves. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Maybe three or four. I don't know. Yeah. What was your first uh, performance? Well, my first, uh, my opening night was Otello with Domingo, Ooh. Renee Fleming, James Morris, and Levine conducting. That's starting at the top, man. Yeah. Uh, Pete, uh, I think Mark and Pete played cornet, and me and Dolph played trumpet. And uh, Jim, that was one of the operas that, that Jim used to love, love playing. Um, so uh, the big takeaway from that was, uh, you know, coming from Vancouver Opera where you have one cast and you do, you know, four operas a year, six performances was 
that was opening night and we had to be back in our seats the next morning at 10 30 and to rehearse another one of the 21 or 22 operas that we were doing that season uh so the the, the workload is um it's 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 punishing you know we're now up to 25 26 productions a season um uh as opposed to 21 when I started. So you're, you're, you're spending a lot of time in the chair. For, for people who don't know, the um, operas are, are so demanding that singers cannot sing two nights in a row. You know, everything's acoustic, nothing is miked. So they're filling at 4,000 seat theater acoustically. And there are four or five operas in rotation every night. So it's a different opera every night. And then it starts over every fourth or fifth night with a repeat. So Otello probably occurred twice that week. And then it might be Magic Flute, or the Marriage of Figaro, Valkyrie or something like that. And then whatever's going into the rotation next is rehearsing during the days. And so the stagehands are working 24 hours a day. So as soon as that performance of Otello ended, the stagehands come in, they strike that set, they put in what's gonna rehearse the next morning, and then there's Marriage of Figaro or whatever it is. And as soon as that rehearsal's over, they strike that and they put in whatever's gonna be torn dot or you name it. And it, it's just, it, it's going like that. And they also, the they also do that for the other, not just for the stage, but for the other two rehearsal rooms. Uh, yeah. There's, yeah. there's two, two downstairs rehearsal rooms, one which is used for blocking mostly, which is the larger of the two. And then there's the orchestra room. Yeah, those would be like skeleton sets. So it won't, that won't be the whole, the whole business, but it, it's a, it's a gigantic operation. You know, the last time I was at the Met, and this is a completely unrelated story, but I thought, thought it was funny, so I'll tell you, and all 14 people can hear it. I, I sit down, I'm just by myself, and there's this couple that sits down next to me, and this guy is, you know, Jim, I, I went down to the cafeteria with you on this, and, and it was this happened after I saw you. So the guy, he's really into the opera, and you can tell he's he's into it, and he knows the story. He says, what do you do? I say, well, I'm a musician. And, and he's like, oh, yeah, me too. And, of course, you've heard this so many times. And the guy says, uh, and the guy looks like he's probably in his 60s, early 60s. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm a musician. I'm, I'm a piano player. I play piano. I play jazz piano. I, I, I used to have a little, little substance abuse problem. So I, I mostly just teach now. I said, oh, okay. And he says, I was the music director for Gloria Gaynor in the 70s. God. I said, I bet. I mean, I'm thinking like, I will survive in the 70s. I bet you had a substance abuse problem. <laughs> that's, that's what I was thinking. Come about. on, Mark. We, we all did. Come on. That was a little, little young for me. But. I was like four. So, um, and I know that, Jim, I think you probably got to gotta wrap it up in a little bit, I, I'm guessing. But... Uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about, well, two questions, I'm one for both of you. Who are your favorite singers to work with that you would listen to? That, and there's so many, I know it's hard, to, it's hard to boil it down, but if you're a trumpet player, who are you trying to imitate? Or maybe that's a better way of thinking about it too. Well, I, I think D Domingo, because of the number of roles he did in I would say pretty close to his prime when I started and Pete, when you started, you know, I still associate uh, Vauquier and the, uh, and uh, Samson and Delilah, um, uh, Queen of Spades. Uh, as far as, there's so many, I mean, um, I didn't really try and imitate any of that, but I took what I, I, I could from it, you know, Horosovsky with his phrasing. Um, I often wanted to sound more like a soprano. Uh, it, 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 and by that, I mean, bring those highs and narrow down the sound to be a little lighter to, 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 to help support the section more. And I, I, I remember feeling like a, a bass sometimes instead of a, a soprano in the job. So I was gravitated towards those lower voices, I think. Uh, Bryn Turfel, uh, so many. I mean, and 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 there were some nights where you know the singing wasn't so great, but you had to give 
uh, credit to the fact that no matter what was going on, those people stood up there and, and did that night after night. It's quite intimidating stepping on that stage for the first time, Pete. I know I sort of took over the Carmen um, stage trumpet role after at some point. And in the production that we did, you had to walk out on stage and play your little bugle calls right, right, right. Tw twice, you know. And and uh, the first time I, I went out there, I was looking into the audience and like, this is nuts. What the <laughs> hell am I doing here? I can't, I can't do this. Or Aida, you know, standing up there and watching the, the ballet and the whole scene and the 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 procession on stage and seeing seeing and hearing the reaction of the audience, you know, being a part of what was rightfully called the Grand Opera, um, which uh, uh, apparently has passed its due date according to our, our glorious general manager. Now, now. I'll ask you about that in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> Who were your favorite singers? Oh, I had... Uh favorite favorite singers i was crazy about um this is not an unusual singer i loved ruth ann swenson's voice yeah yeah i thought i thought her i thought her she had the most beautiful resonant tone throughout her entire register and i would i would listen to her sing the telephone book Whereas other singers had it for four or five notes or half an octave. They're all very fine, but you know, though that, that sound that makes you go. Like and, 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 and uh, it was like that every night, the consistency was yeah. crazy. It was just heavenly. Yeah. I mean, not the greatest actress, apparently, you know, people had problems with her, you know, acting or whatever. Everyone has, you know, everyone's a critic, but, uh, and then in general, I mean, the level of singing is, is so high that, and I think this reflects on the orchestra. You just, you don't imitate a particular singer, but the orchestra gains a flexibility that is unique, right? So everybody, you're playing in the pit, but everybody has their antenna out. You're watching the conductor, but you're listening to the stage and each other. And I've seen it numerous times where the conductor goes, and the orchestra goes, uh-uh. And they go with the stage. Happens a lot. Yeah, they get quite frustrated by it. Why isn't the orchestra with me? You know, because that's you know, not the gig. And and it's so and and then people, Jim might be able to talk about this. When you go then to a symphony orchestra, it feels very cold and mathematical. It the music doesn't breathe like the opera orchestra does. So the orchestra plays very differently based on that experience and it's not so it's not really studied it some people studied of course but it's more like osmosis you know where your phrasing just become everything breathes and it's not yet you know note machines it's it has a wonderful uh uh, uh effect on on the orchestra and we hear that then when we go on tour it sounds different than hearing uh, uh, the Cleveland Orchestra or some some established symphony orchestra. We we play differently. We treat music differently. You know, I, I think it's a result of that. I think that also relates a little bit to, you know, Pete, Pete and I couldn't be more extreme in terms of, uh, or, or, or far apart in terms of technical ability, um, sound concept a little bit. <laughs> And, and uh, the, the orchestra is sort of not this cookie cutter thing. Like, you know, I, I, I only half jokingly call it the land of misfit toys. You know, I'm, I'm a square peg, but they gave me a round hole. And so you get this, you know, Whitney Crockett, who's principal bassoon in LA now and came from Montreal and played Bolero and all the French material a billion times with Montreal. He said, you, you, hear, you hear the Met to Bolero you're hearing personality in every entrance and just a little bit different take. It's not this uniformity that goes on. Um, sometimes to great effects, some, sometimes not so much, but. It depends on the individual who's got the solo. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and we've all had that solo. So we're, we're speaking from experience. Yeah. Well, uh, I hate to end on a, a, a dark note, but can you talk about what's going on now that as much as you can anyway, I know you're on the negotiating committee and, but uh, where are things? 
Well, if you want to check out what we're doing, go to metorchestramusicians.com on Facebook or on Twitter. Uh, look us up. Um, uh, in a nutshell, um, the Met furloughed us April 1st. Uh, so up until six weeks ago, we were without any payment from the Met. Uh, where most orchestras have negotiated agreements going forward uh, at, um, you know, uh, anywhere from a significant to marginal different pay scale and have produced throughout the pandemic, either electronically behind a paywall, small pop-up concerts, other non-traditional venues. Uh, the Met has decided not to do that. They've decided to not do anything until we're all back. Uh, and not distancing, which is ironic because our glorious general manager has pleaded his case for many years about being flexible and being imaginative and has sought work rule changes and changes in the contract to facilitate that. Along with those changes come dramatic reduction in salary. Uh, so we feel as an orchestra committee uh, that they are using a temporary situation, albeit emergent situation, uh, but a temporary situation to enact uh, permanent changes to compensation. And so while they may come to you and say, well, this orchestra took a 20% reduction, you know, my answer to that is, yeah, but they've been paid that salary for a whole year where you haven't been paying us. So we came to them many times with programming ideas to utilize us, to keep us fresh in the public's mind, and they chose to go a different way. Currently, we're receiving something called bridge pay or supplementary unemployment benefit. Uh, we're starting to do a few pop-up concerts and be more active. The musicians themselves organized uh, a charitable foundation and have put on wonderful concerts with great success. Pete, I believe you're involved in some of the brass stuff. Yeah, because you you were across this other side of the country and couldn't play it. I couldn't play it if I was there. I came out of retirement. <laughs> but uh, you know they haven't seen fit to pay us or to be imaginative in utilizing us. And, and they've, uh, they've locked out local one, the stagehands. Yeah, they, Their they, contract they, has expired. They're locked out, and until local one comes back, the met ain't happening. They've yeah. also outsourced work to uh, other musicians. Uh, that were not from the Met and produced concert using other musicians yeah, in, um, Europe, yeah. in, in Europe. And they have started to, uh, they've, they're building sets and uh, overseas and in non-union shops in the United States. But I expect the Teamsters will see to that. Wow. There might be a trailer fire on Route 95. Or Amsterdam Avenue. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody will know who, who started, I, I assume. I know a guy. <laughs> Jeez. Well, that doesn't sound very good. Uh... It's not. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I'm not an optimist by nature, but I, I, I uh, recently there's, I think, you know, great strides locally in New York going forward. And, um, you know, there was a war roaring 20s after the last flu pandemic, and hopefully there'll be another. We just got to avoid the stock market crash and the world war that came after that one. We'll be fine. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I'm at the tail end of this dinosaur ride. What, what, what I feel for is my colleagues who are new to this business and have achieved their dream jobs um, and aren't able to practice their craft and, and, uh, and support their families. Yeah. And being unduly, unduly punishment punished. It, it doesn't have to be that way. There's, many creative and responsible managements who seem to be going ahead and employing their musicians and the Met is not amongst them. Well, I know we all hope you guys are back um, sometime in the fall, perhaps. We're, uh, we're, we're the, the schedule is uh, to start in September. Yeah. Well, until then, I guess you'll keep practicing and Pete will keep playing Bach cello suites in his basement. Yeah, when are you going to buy a cello, Pete? <laughs> I got Rafi out looking for one for me. <laughs> well, gentlemen, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, you don't have to sign off right away, but uh, I, thanks. 
Pete, for the last second surprise. I'm sure you guys are in touch, but it's nice to see you guys on screen together. And, and Jim, thanks for talking about your career. And, and obviously, there's so many more things we could get into. We could be on here all night talking about sound concepts and where you place the sound and, you know, seven too high, years. too low. Too high. Just, Just right. When's, when's that, when is the t-shirt going to be produced? That's what I want to want to know. For this I got thing. a couple of t-shirt ideas in, 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 uh, yeah. The one with trumpet careers, I think is coming out. <laughs> yeah. You I got to get on that. Post, post those cartoons. If, if, uh, what you don't know or may or may not know is Pete is a talented and prolific cartoonist. Not compared many to Jeff Kernow, I'm a doodler. Yes, well, many of uh, many of the the parts that Pete has played are uh, embellished, shall we say? Uh, some quite ornately and and cleverly. There's a lot of downtime in the opera for trumpet. Well, how how else are you going to write a book about <laughs> trumpet playing? Exactly. Oof. Did you write it in the pit? Sometimes. Yeah, well, I, I, I've been spending, I've, I've been working on this thing for 25 years. So it's like, you know, that doesn't mean it's good. It just means I'm slow. No, so sure I worked on it in the, in the pit. Yeah. I mean, but a lot of times it was just, you know, I didn't, I, I just, you know, you have tacits of 25 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, you know, and you're sitting there and, and if you, if you count the rest, you'll go out of your mind, you know, when yeah. Yeah. I'm I'll wait to get my hands on a on a copy, but I, I will say uh, I've always found your 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 discussing and writing about the pedagogical aspects of your playing is it's um, it's just so well thought out and one can argue always the merits of someone's approach, right? But and I'm not saying I'm arguing yours, but it's 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 so lucid that I think anyone could 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 really grasp these concepts. I I saw some of it in in its proof. Well, thank you. Proof, proof form. Well, and, I, and, I, I, and I did steal freely from our mutual experience. You know, you hear these singers, right? And they're not doing histrionic breathing, and they're not turning red in the face while they're you know singing. And, and you know, and you're holding a trumpet. And you're going, yeah. Can I do what they do? You know, is 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 there a way? So that was kind of a little bit of my motivation. Yeah, I think we, we touched on that earlier and also touched on my early experiences with the Chickowitz and Jacobs thing and where maybe Jacobs ideas got corrupted with regards to trumpet playing. Oh, they but, think you know, they did, yeah. So, so, so many teachers say, uh, well, sing it, sing it. Well, how many of them have heard singing? You know, we got to hear it up close night after night. You know, the first time I wanted to do Fille de Regiment in, in rehearsal, this, this Pavarotti is like 10 feet away. You know, I'm just like, I don't oh. believe this. You oh, know? that's a high C. <laughs> yeah. Did you guys talk about that a little bit? Because a lot of times I think when people say sing it, especially trumpet players, because we're not singing the same way or the same volume, it gets really far back in the throat. It gets kind of too wide, too open. Did you find that a lot of singers were like, way more forward than you expect absolutely That's and it's, it's, it's it's especially dependent upon the language too uh french uh in particular and and the voice type you know those 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 high lyric tenors juan diego flores and all that to me it's a more front high placement almost nasally especially if speaking french the russian yeah. language was a little more glottal in the back the, the russians are a little further back but even the italians that have the ping in their sound it's way in the front. Yeah, yeah. And you can hear when a Russian sings Italian. It's like it's back here. It sounds like a little weird. Yeah, yeah. I had that experience many times with Natremko. All of a sudden, that color changes and the, the placement of the of, of the, the the tone changes. Um, and the other thing, the misnomer is uh, the mistake I find that people make when playing vocal transcriptions is they don't get a good vocal coach to coach them or have a good model that they listen to and that 
my phrasing it looks at how long I can phrase. It's like, yeah, but that's not what the language says. That's not what the libretto says. There's a comma in there if you look at it. How are you going to pronounce that? Is there, are you rolling the R's? Is there an appreciable pulse on that syllable? I have yet to roll an R <laughs> on the trumpet. Well, <laughs> I still can't, fl I still can't flutter to But, but there's all these, these nuances that, that, that come into play, which you can only uh, know if you experience it. And we, you know, we've been lucky enough to, to experience that. Yeah, well, that's yeah, because you, and you feel like that's where people mis misinterpret, you know. The I think the I yeah the air the, the the volume of air, but I think the last thing sometimes sing uh, trumpet players should be listening to is other trumpet players. Oh yeah, I, I can't. I mean, I, you know, we all go on social media and hear great playing, right? But you know, for, for, for me, for my tastes, I'm leaning towards in free time, if I do any listening to trumpet players, it's either jazz players or natural instrument players um, or historic instrument players, where you can have maybe a better, a better informed opinion of how to approach the Haydn or the Hummel because you hear it played on key trumpet or how to approach a Baroque piece because you hear it on natural trumpet, you know? And get There's a little spectacular natural trumpet players. Oh yeah. So so you know, yeah, listen to trumpet players, but broaden your yeah your portfolio a little bit. Well, I'll I'll I'll, I'll mention that everybody. This is like right out of my book. I, my apologies, but like all all the trumpet players, they pay lip service to you know you know a vocal technique and they play your Bordoni, your Conconi and you know, whatever studies, but they use techniques that are completely different than singers, right? So singers don't go, <sighs> they go, ah, uh, right? Uh, I had that approach. Uh... And it, it's two different things. It's two different body functions and they'll get two different sounds. And, you, had... and the one is less expressive than the other. So I had, I had the experience with someone I took lessons from, from of going and take playing a Bordoni study or Roshu. And I had always been taught to make some music with it. I know it's a broad term, but do some inflection. What are you going to stress? Yeah, play line, give it direction, all that stuff. But throw a little vibrato, to taper a phrase, you know, take some time there. And I did it. And this person's like, no, man, that's not how you do that. It's like, oh, really? Well, how do I do it? <laughs> I want each note connected, one solid block of sound to the next, no nuance. Yeah, like, like a Union Pacific Railroad. Well, and I, 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 I now know what they were trying to get me to connect to, and that, that wasn't the end result, but I was using these pieces as mini arias, if you will, mini etudes not as a an exercise yeah that's what they're designed for yeah yeah and and hmm. I, I i played it how they wanted and they were very excited and i thought this isn't going to work for me this is <laughs> this is not a good match and and it's it's in all likelihood what i needed at the time but it, it just wasn't where i was coming from and and you know we have to also decide at some point what's what works for us and what doesn't and, and that that was not my my concept or, or as our colleague or as our infamous colleague used to say you can hit every single note and still miss every single note that's right yeah yeah you can it's hit true. every note and still not make any music at all and i, th I hear a lot of that in the professional world yes I well, well, you, more. well you have to look at what's prized now right yeah, and that's that's uh you're coming perfection yeah because you can do it all magically uh with editing right and that wasn't the case you lived you had to live with a lot of stuff warts and all um, well but also taking chances try to make some music instead of you know just punching out the notes i i i think every generation of player says that too well back in my day you know well, we can hear it on records, though. We, if you listen from the, the 60s and the 70s, 
you know, those, you know, for all the warts, you know, if you listen to guys like Gitala, you know, and those, you know, they weren't the most amazing trumpet players, but man, they made some music. You know, uh, uh, I had not been dismissive, dismissive of Bernie Adelstein, but I was more to the quote Chicago stuff and, you know, worshiping at Bud's feet. And then when I went back the last few years and re-listened to a lot of that stuff with Bernie playing, man, what a, what an exciting player. Just take you out of your chair, you know? So there, I think that exists a little more if I can generalize in European orchestras more than American ones. There's a genericness and a sameness to some of them. I talked earlier about Chikowitz's pedagogy class. Here's a Russian orchestra playing Tchaikovsky four. Listen for the vibrato and the horns. Listen to the characteristic of the B flat trumpet on this. Listen to those things. And now it's, here's the box, fit your shit inside this box. I call it FM 100, middle of the road trumpet playing. That's it. I call it my safe space. But that's what you have to do to win an audition. You you cannot stray from FM 100. Yeah, it's not it's not really a prized uh, attribute these days. No with cer with, with certain exceptions. So, you know, I remember pre-screening horn. Uh, I'll go date myself and call them tapes. Uh, recordings. Oh, eight hear, tracks. I remember those. Yeah, and hearing this, uh, we wound up the Victrola and. Uh, Put on the wax cylinder but uh we would i heard this horn player just play the spots out of what was on the page like very outside the box and it, it was really exciting but and i mentioned this uh, uh after the fact to one of my horn colleagues and they're like we don't want that uh, I, they were like one of the principals they're like i don't want to deal with that you know so you got to find the sweet spot on the job and maybe a little bit in the audition. And you also have to adapt once you get on the job with, with the, the culture and the style. We've all had to make those changes. I know going to the Philharmonic from, from the Met, my, one of my big issues was just playing on top of the beat. It's like, I, I couldn't believe how far ahead of the beat I felt and, and being proactive with your time and your, and, and more strict with the rhythm than you would ever in an opera orchestra. We tried to That's demonstrate- like what I was saying. We tried to demonstrate once uh, how to play the end of Tosca versus how it's written. Ba, 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 you know, and the tradition is bum, 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 ba, 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 Completely oh, different animals. Played it's written. Yeah all these yeah. conventions and and follows the language yeah we're i'm doing that now as part of this dallas concert we're doing a brass concert and there's some stuff from carmen on there and i'm like this is not how it goes they take time there they hold that note out they stretch the note they take a breath here they take a breath there so i don't know how that's all going to work in a brass concert but you know we'll is Luis involved he's not conducting that concert but he and in, he invited the you know about him inviting i knew that but i wondered if he was involved in the brass thing because you would have an opera a theater man you know in charge yeah that would be great but uh, i think we have one of the assistant conductors or one of the percussionists which is which Worse. is going to be i mean well uh, keep us keep us organized anyway it's uh, it's not a super ambitious program but um pretty straight ahead but you know we've not played together in uh, over a year and uh, I I did something here for Vancouver Opera last month and I did a concert in Montreal in October and that's the uh, you know the extent of my concertizing live anyway so it's it's going to be an adjustment exactly yeah, by the way I guess I actually somebody wrote in a, and, and they had a question I want to ask one more question Jim about can you talk about when you were in the Philharmonic and, and playing second trumpet, the Phil and that kind of support versus being support in the in an opera orchestra, like the different concept of sound and maybe the way you approached it. Well, I had to I had to load up on the fronts of notes more, and I had to in general not taper things too much at the end. 
I played at a far more extreme dynamic level on, on the loud side. Um, I had, we didn't play that soft, uh, even at the softest. Um, and with regards to sitting next to Phil, uh, you know, that was just riding on his coattails. You were never, ever asking questions about how he was going to do something. He just did it. Had the same experience with Paul Markello in Montreal playing second to him, with Dave Bilger playing second to him. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a blinders thing, but there's an assuredness that they have about what they're doing that-, that Predictability. Consist yeah, consistency and predictability. Um, and, you know, sitting next to Phil many times, I'd see him doing this with his trumpet. I'm like, does he not think I could count? You know, I'm supposed to be bringing him in. I'm the second trumpet player, you know, I'm supposed to be counting him in. Wrong um, orchestra. Yeah. But then I noticed when he played by himself, he was doing the exact same thing. And it was more about his timing, whatever he was doing. Um, but yeah, brightening the sound, front loading the articulations, playing at higher volume levels, and also performing at rehearsal. Um, it's, you know, I won't say expected, but it's forgiven when you join an opera orchestra that the rehearsal may not go so well for you because you just haven't played in any of it. You know, uh, the Philharmonic, it was like you opened up that case and you're performing right away. I'm sure Pete had the same experience when he was on trial with them. So in some ways it brought out the best of my playing. I, it was, what, what a sound, what an experience. Um, ultimately I went back to the Met um, twice now. What's wrong with me? Uh, the cafeteria coffees probably. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but um, yeah, the, you have to do that when you go to an orchestra. You have to keep your ears open. And look, if, if I had not gotten the job at the Philharmonic, and I was thrilled to death to be on that stage with Phil in the audition playing excerpts. And in spite of the circumstances, you know, in spite of uh, Mazel calling stuff from the audience and having a big book there, flipping through it, oh, let's, let's play this. Uh, Mandarin, okay. Uh, oh, so I'll get the piccolo trumpet out and do some some handle, you know, um, just being in the moment and getting to experience that was uh, reward enough, never mind getting the job. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they were happy to have you back in the pit, though, once you came back to the mat. Or maybe not. I don't know. Nobody commented. <laughs> that's, that's for them to tell you, not to me. I was, I was glad to be back. Well, yeah, yeah, we we had all kinds of plans to stick you with all the French operas and the you know the bell count right. stuff. And boy, when he comes back, he's going to get all the crap, all, all uh, the all the crappy work. I had to fight to to not give up my locker to Ray Riccamini. I had this pro great spot for the locker, double locker, double size locker. Ray's like, I'm going to take it. I said, I I haven't given up the job yet. Once I give up the job, you can have the locker. He wasn't really trying. If he'd yeah. been trying. Yes. <laughs> well, guys, thank you so much for, for uh, doing this. And I, I'm sure a lot of people enjoyed it. And, and Jim, well, Pete, congratulations on your retirement and the new book. And, and Jim, best of luck with the negotiations. And everybody's hoping you're back in the seat before too long. Yeah, us, us too. And uh, okay. midnight always, no matter what, midnight always comes, right, Pete? Hello, Santi. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. And thanks, everybody who uh, who signed in tonight. And uh, we'll see you uh, next time. Thanks. A pleasure. Okay. Take Can care, guys. Up? Take care. Be safe. Get your damn vaccines. Pete left.